All right. So I'm going to get going exploiting Unicode enabled software. Um, there's a lot of stuff to talk about. So let me see if my clicker is working. Nope. Okay. Yeah, it's working. Okay, so I got some uh, contact information for me, including our, our uh, website. We can find more information about some of this stuff and our uh, company website, of course, cassabasecurity.com. So the agenda today is to go through a quick crash course in Unicode um, and go through some of the root causes for the vulnerabilities and it provides sort of the methodology for finding some of these attack vectors in software. And then also I have a couple tools I'm going to be releasing today. Actually, the talk after this, I'm going to pretty much walk through them in more detail. And they're designed to pro provide some testing around Unicode as well, some more automation where there really is none. So, you know, the history of character sets goes way back. Uh, to 1963, maybe earlier. I'm, I'm not really an expert here, but it, it started with ASCII 7-bit when everybody pretty much agreed that that had to be standardized. From there, it moved on up through EBCDIC, which IBM standardized. Everybody grew to pretty much loathe. And slowly from there, more standards emerged. ISO jumped in the mix and said, it's getting crazy. There's too many character sets. We can't exchange data across systems. We can't exchange data across the world. We need to start um, agreeing on some standards. In 1990, um, ISO proposed the UCS, which was a uni universal character set. And then around that same time, Unicode was actually being developed by some other smart folks. And Unicode pretty much took the lead shortly after when they released their first uh, standard in 1991. So it's a pretty old standard. It's been around a long time. Uh, there's a lot to it. So when you look at a character at the top of the pyramid, the glyph, the letter A, there's a lot of stuff it takes to uh, support that character in Unicode. Um, if you start to dig through it, you know, underneath you've got encodings which help represent that character. There's actually a lot of properties associated with these characters, a lot of metadata. Every, code, every character has a code point, scripts assigned to it, and a plane that it lives in. Uh, most characters that I'm concerned about live in the basic multilingual plane, which is um, zero through FFFF in Unicode. And there's actually 17 planes in total. Um, the most common is the BMP. So the Unicode attack surface pretty much is everything. I mean, it goes from the operating system through programming languages to applications, depending on how they use it, all the way to the end user who can be fooled by visual spoofing attacks. So this is just a page out of a uh, sort of an ancient text that represents uh, the Ogham script which is an old um, Celtic sort of language. I mean, this is, this is what I gather at Unicode. The people who design and manage Unicode have a lot of pride in the fact that they can capture uh, these ancient historical languages and scripts, and they can assign numbers to them, and basically we can, we can now capture them forever. So um, Unicode is is not a two-byte character. So if you've been thinking that, just unthink it because it's a trap. Um, as you'll see, that's, that's kind of a common uh, paradigm we run into. A lot of programmers think, hey, two bytes, I'm good to go. The truth about Unicode is it's very large and complex standard. Right now, I need uh, the theme song to 2001 A Space Odyssey. Dun, 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 dun. There's a lot of stuff that goes into the standard, right? <laughs> if you've ever looked at this book or tried to pick it up, you might hurt yourself. I mean, it's about 2,000 pages or so. So what I've tried to do here is, in this presentation, is at least pull out the parts that are relevant for us in the security community. Um, if you're making business decisions around inter internationalization or if you're testing software and need to verify 
software is free from vulnerabilities. Hopefully, there'll be something in here for you. So, I've got a big wrong way sign here, mainly because um, if you're used to dealing with these sort of legacy character sets, Shift GIS, Windows 1252, ISO 88591, just, just don't do it. I mean, Unicode is here to stay. It's, it's almost 20 years old. Um, if it's used end to end, it's generally pretty safe. Um, when you start dabbling in all these other character sets and try to try to start a, start to try transforming between them, a lot of issues start to pop up. Unicode can represent everything that all these character sets can represent in a single framework. The ASCII range is preserved in Unicode. They're, everything's directly mapped to the same ASCII range that we've been using for 40 plus years. Um, Unicode standard is now up to 5.1, which uses a 21-bit scalar value and actually has space for over a million code points. And right there is the, uh, the nomenclature in Unicode, U plus 000 to U plus 10 FFFF is the full range. I'll talk more about that in a second. These are code points in Unicode, and that's how they're normally represented um, per the standard and any, any specification you look at. Every character has a unique number represented by this hex value. And actually calling them characters is sort of incorrect too, um, but it's, it's easier to talk about them that way, I find. So if you dig into a character and start to look at what makes it up, you'll see a lot of stuff. Um, if you start here on the top left, you know, every character gets assigned a category. This is a a letter, an uppercase letter A, okay? So we want to provide some metadata about it. Unicode also defines the mappings, which is interesting, right? For two lower and two upper operations. So you know uh, exactly what you're supposed to do when this character is uppercase or lowercase. Uh, every character is assigned a script block. And then if you move up to the top right, and just every character gets a name, a decomp type, a mapping, and binary properties associated with it. So here's another character, Latin small letter long S, and I just highlighted a couple things in red here just to show where stuff starts to get interesting when you're testing software and looking for vulnerabilities, right? This character, which is still in the basic multilingual plane, it's still a Latin script, um, but it's not an ASCII character. But when this character is uppercase, it becomes uh, upper, uppercase letter S, okay? Um, and when this character is decomposed, its mapping decomposes to a lower lowercase letter s. All right, so just we can keep that in the back of our minds right now. Uh, casing operations and mapping operations can definitely transform characters. So I lied a little bit because the, the full 21-bit range is not actually available in Unicode. There's a reserved range, D800 to DFFF, that do not get assigned characters. So these are what we call the surrogate pairs. and um, uh, they're used to provide a way for Uni Unicode UTF-16 to represent a character outside of the basic multilingual plane. This is one of those characters. The, this character comes from an ancient uh, script from a Phaistos disc uh, in ancient Greek, Greece. So if you look closer at this character, over on the left you can see the encoding representations, right? UTF-8, this is a four byte. UTF-16, this is also a four byte, and UTF-32, it's also a four byte, okay? But in UTF-16, you have to actually combine two pairs of, of double bytes to represent this character, and that's what we call a surrogate pair. Um, that's what the range is for, it's so you can use two pairs from the surrogate range to represent any other character outside of the basic multilingual plane. All right. So. It's probably uh, fair to say, you know, when you get into Unicode, you're getting into like information overload. So, um, if you got any questions, just ask. Um, I, I got a lot of stuff in here, so I, I don't mean to overload anybody, but it's a, it's a lot of background information that's kind of important to get through. So, the encoding mechanisms that Unicode defines are UTF-8, UTF-16, UTF-32. So, just FYI. UTF-7 is dead and deprecated. It's been deprecated for years, so if you ever see somebody trying to implement it, just slap them on the wrist. 
and tell them they don't need to do that. Um, UTF-8 also is one to four bytes. It used to be six, caused a lot of problems. You should never be generating uh, UTF-8 that's over four bytes or, um, or, or uh, interpreting it for that matter. So UTF-8 is really nice. It's, that's why it's on the web because it's, it's performance-wise, it's great. I mean, it represents most of the basic multilingual plane in just a couple bytes. All the ASCII characters are preserved in a single byte. UTF-16 and UTF-32 um, start getting bigger, and they're both Indian, so they can be little or big Indian. And UTF-16 is actually variable width. Like you saw with the surrogate pairs, it's going to be two bytes or four bytes. UTF-32 is always four bytes. It's actually a fixed mapping. You don't need any algorithms to map between characters. It's actually really nice, but um, of course it's memory intensive because using ASCII for everything like you do on the web, then you've you've got three bytes that are wasted. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about root causes, and there's a whole bunch of them. So I'm going to start, I probably should speed up a little bit. So visual spoofing attacks. Um, with over 100,000 assigned characters in Unicode, there's a lot of lookalikes within a single script and also across scripts. So let's talk about IDN, internationalized domain names. Okay. What do the browsers do? So there's specifications and guidance around this. Um, IDNA is international, Internationalized Domain Names for Applications, and this, is, this, this gives um, applications guidance for how to implement internationalized domain names. Uh, it defines na uh, to use name prep. Name prep is a way to prepare uh, strings and domain names for representation and for processing. And it's a process of normalizing to form a certain form, KC, and prohibiting certain characters. Um, finally, uh, Punicode is a part of that. And that link, which you've probably seen before, the hideous XN dash dash links, because DNS is incapable of, uh, doesn't support U Unicode, right? I mean, U DNS supports ASCII only. We have to map everything back to a, an ASCII equivalent. So if I hand you some characters like we just saw, like the plumed head or something outside of the ASCII range, it has to be Punicode mapped back down to an ASCII equivalent for DNS to handle it. Some browsers actually whitelist TLDs, and I'll show you why this is a problem in a couple slides. Um, some people think you need a .cn to pull off a visual spoofing attack, but well, that's not true. You can do it with a .com, you can do it with a .org. So um, let's get to some of that. See if I can. Okay. So, what's the problem with IDN? Well, if you look around, everybody's pretty divergent on how they implement Unicode. Okay, it's all um, very underlooked. I say. I mean, a lot of confusables exist. We'll see those in a minute. The IDNA and the name prep specifications are based on Unicode 3.2, which is many years old. All those standards are being updated to IDNA 2008 later this year, uh, but of course it's going to take a lot of time for all the software to catch up. Every time a new version of Unicode comes out, uh, new characters are introduced. So let's talk about IDN homograph attacks. Some browsers actually allowed IDNs in the .com namespace, right? This is a website that I registered just to pull off this spoof right? Because some people don't believe it's still possible. But as you can see, you can't tell that that's not google.com. Obviously, it is not google.com. And I put a little note to my mom there just to say hi. And I showed her that. But this, this works in Safari. This works in Opera. It really is user agent specific and how they implement it. Um, under other circumstances, it'll actually work in some of the other browsers as well. So what's going on here, right? It looks identical. Uh, Google.com is, is, is not the Google.com that you're seeing. And there are the two Gs I put down there side by side. They're indistinguishable visually. And I put them in a courier font too because most of the browsers implement a monowidth font in the status bar and the URL bar. 
to try to make things more readable. Um, so what you're going, what's going on here is you got uh, the Latin letter A, uh, G, and I'm spoofing it with another Latin lookalike for a lowercase g. So that's a problem, right? Um, I mean, we can't have users being fooled that easily. So plus it jeopardizes the whole concept of IDN. The guidance around this is normalization, um, provi providing some confusable detection, which actually have a, working on a tool that is going to do this, um, and following the specifications for IDNA and spring, uh, string prep. Guidance is also provided. There's a lot of stuff, right? I mean, it's not easy. You, just don't, you can't just go implement IDN. I mean, you're implementing a whole protocol. I can. Um, the Global Internet Authority has an inclusion-based guidance. They tell you to limit certain scripts, and this is their guidance for the registries, right? The top-level registries like VeriSign, Peer, who does .org, um, and all the registrars underneath them are supposed to follow this guidance. But of course, we can have malicious registrars. We all know that. Um, but once it gets up to the registry level, these things should be prohibited: certain scripts, certain characters. Um, now, let's take a look, a closer look at what ICANN's saying. So inclusion-based guidance, they have a de uh, default deny all. That's good. That's a nice concept. Uh, script limitations. So they're saying, let's just limit this top-level domain.com to certain scripts. OK, that's OK. But even within a single script, there's still a lot of lookalike characters to choose from. And then character limitations, I have that boxed out in red because that's not really buying us much, right? Um, ICANN's saying, don't. You, we're not allowed to we're not allowing users to register syntax, punctuation, and punctuation type characters in a domain label. That's that's good. However, as we'll see in a minute, um, we can use subdomain labels for that and pretty much fool users all day long. Um, so, in the end of the day, the registrars still allow confusables, and they still allow these single, whole, and mixed script. They really can't control syntax spoofing in the subdomains. So I want to talk a little bit more about the non-Unicode uh, homograph attacks and the confusables, visibles, and some other things. So traditionally, you know, you don't need Unicode to pull off a spoof. An R and an N together can look like an M in certain fonts. Okay, so you got it here. You know, you might think that's mullets, but uh, it's not. It's R N. Um, so are you using mono width fonts for your users, right? Fonts are important because in certain fonts, characters display differently. Now, a lot of the Unicode characters actually display differently. And sometimes a zero looks like an O, one looks like an L. And this is a Courier font you're seeing here. And this has always been the case, right? So the five and the S, this is like where the leet speak can end up being used for visual spoofing attacks. We got the classic long phishing URLs, you know, login.facebook. blah, 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 blah. And end users might be fooled by that. So. Back to Unicode. So the confusables are a way to define um, this problem through single, mixed, and whole script attacks. So here's an example of a single script attack, which I actually showed you with the, G with the Google. It's where a user thinks the A in apple.com is legit, but really it's the a, a Latin small letter alpha. Okay. Um, same thing in, in lookout.net down here. The user thinks they see a K, but really they see a Latin letter cra. That's single script because you're actually using characters within the same script. Here's mixed script. We're using characters across scripts, OK? The, those O's up there in Google, those are really the tie digit, digit zeros. So uh, in Facebook, that C is a, is a Greek sigma. And down at the bottom, we got a Cherokee. I mean, there's so many ways, right? So here's a whole script. Whole script means the entire domain label has been spoofed with a whole separate script. So that ABC and ABC.com is all Cyrillic script. IRS is all Greek script. So there's a lot of a uh, lot of problems here, right? So here's another spoof, right? This actually works today in 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 many browsers actually. .org labels are pretty much whitelisted in a lot of browsers. Whitelisted meaning they're allowed to display the unencoded version of the IDN label. Um, so, I mean, you guys and me. You know, we're suspicious about stuff, so we might be looking closer at the status bar before we click a link and the URL. But you know, mom and dad and everybody else out there, this is going to look like Mozilla.org to them. What's that? <laughs> I mean, 
Here, here it is in uh, Google Chrome, okay? And this, this is provided a couple conditions are, are, are true in Google. So I'm just digging in more of that, look closer at that eye that I was using in the spoof. Oops. So it's just another Latin character. It's the Latin eye with a cute above instead of the dot. So it's in the same Latin script. It's outside of the ASCII range, okay? All right, let's talk about syntax spoofing real quick. Um, this used to be a, a, a popular attack, I think. Years ago, when the browsers were first dabbling in IDN, you could in inject these like full width characters and the full width solidus that looks pretty much just like a slash. You know, you can see here that the last, the true domain here is not trusted.org, but to the user, it looks like google.com, okay? Question? Yeah, the, um, he made a comment that this attack still works. There, are, I think what's going on, because I've tested this in a lot of the browsers, and they all normalize this specific character properly, but there are other characters that look similar to this slash that don't get normalized. See this full width solidus on the next slide? It has a mapping in the Unicode tables, which all the m most proper um, Unicode implementations do correctly now, and they normalize it. Normalize mean reduce it, decompose it to a common slash. Um, so if you try that in any of the browsers today, they'll all normalize it back down. But there are other punctuation characters that exist, which I think is more to your point. Um, the box drawing characters, characters that don't have normalizations assigned to them. So yeah, I mean, it's a big problem still. And what about, what about this case, okay? What about when you don't need a punctuation character? What if I can use a Japanese character that kind of looks like a slash, right? Um, this is probably going to fool quite a bit of people. So this is using a katakana no to visually look like a slash. And if you look at it in most of the browsers, this, this does not get puny code encoded in the URL or the status bar either. So you can get away with this. On the bottom screenshot, you see the puny code equivalent in DNS, you know, the XN dash dash, yuck, um, above that. I mean, if you're glancing at it, it looks like google.com, but really it's not trusted.org. Um, I did want to do a quick demo. Let's see, how are we doing on time? I think we've got about 30 minutes left. <coughs> I will just do a quick demo of that. And Safari. Okay, so if you look, um, let me view Safari's status bar down here at the bottom. It's kind of hard to see, but you know, this is this is your first indication, your first warning is the status bar. This is what the browsers do for you. Okay, they show you the status bar before you click on a link. Well, it looks good to me. Looks like Google.com, right? Still, even here, it looks like Google.com. So really, the browsers haven't told me anything. Okay. You want to see that in Opera or Firefox? <laughs> Same thing. Well, not Firefox, because Firefox actually is pretty restrictive about the .com labels. However, Firefox is um, very open about .org labels. Hence, you see you got the Mozilla.org down there in the status bar. Looks all good, right? But this is a spoof, okay? Just, just trying to drive the point home here. There's no visual indicators to the user. Puny code's ugly. We don't want to do that. If you go back here and look at uh, Google.com, you can see down in the status bar, it got punicoded. Up here in the URL, Firefox punicoded it also. 
But that's no fun. I mean, we don't want to ruin IDN. There's got to be a better way. So, what is a better way? So, we've been working on an anti spoofing API that detects these confusables and detects syntax and punctuation lookalikes. But everybody right now is divergent in the way they do this. So the way I see it, let's just bring it together and have a, a common uh, system for performing this. But I'm not going to talk too much about that. I'm going to keep moving through the visual spoofing attacks because there's other fun things you can do. Um, you have the invisibles in Unicode. So here's a subset of some of the invisibles, three characters actually, the zero width space, the Mongolian vowel separator. That's a favorite, actually. I've pulled off some pretty fun attacks with that one. Um, and the zero width no break space, also known as the bomb. So you can take a closer look at these. So <coughs> up here in the top screenshot, you see you can do, you know, you can have fun with folder names and file names, and they can all look identical to the user, right? Uh, just by injecting a, an invisible zero width type of space character right there in the file name somewhere. If you look down here, kind of shows up in the console because unfortunately the command shell on Windows still doesn't support Unicode. So you get the box. And up there, um, I'm just illustrating the character I stuck in there. I just shoved in a byte order mark in the middle in between the my and the folder and you end up with a visual spoofing attack. <coughs> so you can have fun with bidirectional characters as well. I've actually um, was testing a web app one, at one time and you know, they were popping up a dialog box to warn users about a site they were visiting. And just by injecting a bitty character, I was able to flip the text around, right? So the site tried to warn you, hey, you're visiting, you know, one bad place. Do you really want to go there? But uh, you inject a bitty character, and you can just kind of flip it around, and you can make the URL look legit and pretty much fool the user. So that's some pretty fun stuff. Now, what's up with these bitty characters? Unicode uh, Consortium, they're wise to all this stuff. They're, they're no, no dummies over there. I mean, most of the stuff I'm talking about, they already know, they've documented. Um, these characters are to be avoided whenever possible because of security concerns. These are the bit, bitty override characters, left to right override and right to left override. Basically, you shove this in a string, and it says from this point on, reverse the string. Let's take a look at some other fun stuff you can do with bitty characters. I don't know uh, if you can see that, but that's an executable file that ends in .txt. It looks like it ends in .txt, okay. Really, it ends in .exe, but because I shoved in a bitty uh, character that says reverse this, make it right to left from this point on, um, it flips it around. So it, 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 the, it's actually a txt.exe that looks like a an exe in the end. <coughs> All right, um, I'm going to move on from visual spoofing attacks and start talking about the other things. Uh, I don't kind of running out of time, so I'm going to kind of fly through some of this stuff. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to just show a screenshot of a tool that's going to help find some of these issues in web apps and spend an hour talking about that tool after this if anyone's interested. Um, Best fit mappings are fun too, okay? So the impact here is filter evasion and enabling code execution, uh, which is a pretty much a common pattern for a lot of these root causes. So best fit mappings commonly occur when you're transforming between character sets, okay? So this is when the Greek small letter sigma becomes, um, becomes an S, or the prime character becomes an apostrophe. This is when you get SQL injection attacks to happen because of a best fit mapping. So what's up with that? Well, it's just, it's, it's, it's just kind of a messed up world. I mean, all the APIs might handle things differently. Um, take a look at uh, pinvoke in, in Windows if you're building something in C Sharp and you call pinvoke by default, a best fit mapping is going to occur, okay, because when you're marshalling strings between um, managed and unmanaged code, that string is handled not as a wide string, but as just an LP stir. 
So if you want to override that behavior and make sure that you're not best fit mapping, you can actually define or tell the marshalling to happen using a wide string instead. <clears throat> so the guidance for best fit mappings really is to scrutinize the APIs that you're using. Uh, under Windows, use um, the encoder fallback with system text encoding, because system text encoding in Windows will perform best fit mappings in a lot of different ways. In unmanaged code, if you're using Windows wide card and multi byte functions, there's a flag you can set to tell it not to best fit map, otherwise you will get this ma best fit mapping behavior. A good solution is to use Unicode end to end to avoid the character set transformations. So here's just a sample, okay, just to give you an example of how I was able to pull this off in an attack on a popular social networking site last year. Okay, the attack was filter evasion, right? The exploit was bypassing their filtering logic with the best fit mapping. Let's take a look at the attack. So I was basically trying to get a cross-site scripting attack on this social networking site through some cascading style sheets that they were implementing in one of their profile editors. Okay, so they weren't allowing dash moz dash binding, which is a Firefox specific way to execute script in a style sheet. However, as you can see in red there, I could get the U plus FF4D in to represent the M. Uh, FF4D is a full width wide letter M, and something they were doing behind the scenes in the end was best fit mapping that back down to a Latin letter M. And they were doing that after their validation, okay? So they were inputting, they were taking the string, validating it, and then normalizing it back down to best fit map it. And this is a common theme in Unicode. You have to do validations at the right time, and you have to know where you're handing off strings that they're gonna do validations at the right time. Okay, so let's talk about normalization because this normalization is normally a good thing. Following the same theme, we can also get filter evasion to happen if we don't do validation at the right time. <coughs> this is usually where it comes information overload. Um, normalization, there are actually four normalization forms defo uh, defined in Unicode, and they're either called composed or decomposed, okay? So when you decompose, you take a character or a string and you decompose it to its mapped equivalents. Unicode defines all these mappings already. Some are algorithmic, some are just static table mappings, okay? And then some of the forms like NFC and NFKC actually recompose characters. So they'll decompose a string, and then they'll do lookups, and then they'll recompose it. You might end up, you're, when you normalize, you're going to usually lose data, okay? So you always have to be aware of that. Um, you also could introduce problems if you have a web app or some other system that's trying to filter data, right? So take a look at this um, Latin letter I with a dot above. This is a Latin letter capital I with a dot above, U0130. Uh, now when you normalize this, it becomes two characters, okay? Uh, that's more than two bytes also. Um, but you wind up with an I and a dot as two separate characters when this gets normalized. So the bytes actually change. So was, what's the point? So are there dangerous characters we can use? Yep. So if you're trying to get some, pass a HTML filter or script filter, right? Try this character sometime. FE64, okay? Um, I don't remember the name of that character right now, but when it's normalized using either of the uh, uh, decom decomposition forms, you wind up with a, uh, a greater than, okay? So. You can pull off attacks that way. So here's an example, right? Calling to NFKC on this string, script, gives you what you want, script. However, the original source was not a greater than, but after it's normalized, it is. Normalization guidance, uh, normalize before we validate, okay? And um, in visual spoofing, NFKC is a, a, a good first defense. Non-shortest form UTF-8. Oh, question. Yeah. The, 
question was, will normalization that converts a character from one byte into multi-bytes open you up to buffer overflows and other sorts of attacks? The uh, answer is definitely yes. I actually have a slide coming up on that in just a second, so it's a great question. Um, Non-shortest form UTF-8 is used to be a huge problem. These are like the old IIS Unicode code bugs we were all exploiting back in like 2000, 2001, then Code Red came out, and then it was like, oh my god. Okay, so this can still happen today, and this is what I'm saying. Um, so you hand in a percent C0, percent A7. What is that? Well, usually the OS and the frameworks will reduce that to what it is, percent two seven, which the database ends up getting, which is an apostrophe. That's called, um, ah, sorry. Let me get that out of there. Okay, so it's called overlong because this is a single byte character. This is an ASCII character, yet you're trying to represent it with, with two characters. What, what's going on here? That's, that shouldn't be allowed. Um, actually, the Unicode specification now forbids that as we've seen from the vulnerabilities like IIS Unicode, the generation of non-shortest form and the interpretation of non-shortest form is forbidden. So any UTF-8 system should throw an error if it's generating or getting, interpreting a non-shortest form UTF-8. And that's quite common in web apps. So dot dot slash, right, is like the staple of web app pen testing. So this is when some of the first overlong attacks happened back with the IIS, and it's still going on today. I think it just happened with Apache recently. Um, how many ways can you say it? So here's a slide that kind of shows you a lot of different ways. You got the UTF-8 way, which is just a normal straight representation, 2E, 2E, 2F. And then you've got the overlong way, which is the old IIS attack, which is percent %C0, percent %AE, represents a dot. You go over to the top left, well, there's still more ways to do it, guys. You know, we got normalization compatibility forms. If you're normalizing, then I can stick in this, these, uh, these other characters, and when you normalize them down, I'm going to end up with a dot, dot, slash. And then on the bottom left, I got the best fit mappings, because in a lot of cases, systems do best fit map back down to like an ISO 8859 or a Windows 1252 encoding. So this is just a slide that sort of shows you what those test cases look like. I'm not going to go through it, but this, these will be in the slide deck. Um, so another root cause is handling the unexpected. <coughs> so what does your Unicode software do when it gets unassigned code points? Question. Ah, great question. How is overlong UTF-8 usually handled? Um, and that depends on the API and the system. And this is kind of where all the uh, implementations diverge, right? Um, some uh, .NET framework used to actually just um, ignore it. Um, some systems will throw an error. A lot of APIs can be configured to throw an error. .NET framework now will throw an error if it gets an overlong. So um, you have to really look at the API or the framework that you're using and see what options it gives you for handling overlong UTF-8. Um, it might not be called overlong UTF-8. That's how the Unicode consortium defines it, but people might call it invalid UTF-8 or another name. Um, but then this will go through some of the other stuff. What happens when you get an illegal code point? What happens if I hand you half of a surrogate pair? What happens if I hand you an unassigned code point? something that doesn't have a character. What happens if I hand you a code point with special meaning, like the bomb? What about this case? When I hand you an ill-formed byte sequence, okay? UTF-8 is a four-byte sequence. If I hand you a byte C2, it's indicating to the software that I have a two-byte sequence. What happens if the next byte isn't a valid trailing byte for that sequence? What does the software do? And that, that's also more to your question. It's all about how the software behaves, okay? So here I got C2 highlighted in red. Uh, a lot of software, surprisingly, will just drop that lead byte. Just drop it, okay? So you wind up with the byte sequence that you want as an attacker. Let's take a closer look at that. 
and how you'd pull that off in an attack. And this is actually an attack that that works in other character sets. Um, we've seen this with the multibyte character sets. It still works today in most all the browsers. This specific case doesn't work because most browsers are pretty good with UTF-8 encodings. Um, but this is what it would look like. Um, if I hand you a, an image source and I can control the image source and I can get a C2 byte in there, you stick it in there on the, on the HTML that you return, what the browser ends up seeing is the C2 combined with the double quote makes up the sequence. So it sees a two byte sequence there. It doesn't really care what the second character is. It's going to consume it. It's called overconsumption. So what happens is I'm able to control this part of the HTML and I put a quote on error, quote, alert, and what happens is I'm able to get an attack through um, because the first double quote got consumed inside of the HTML attribute. There's another form of this, um, character substitution. So how do the APIs handle this? Some of them substitute. If they get an invalid byte sequence or an unexpected character, they might substitute with a dot or a slash, which would be pretty bad, especially if you're doing file system operations. They might just delete the character, right? Like you saw in the first example, it just gets dropped. That can be pretty bad, too. Here's an example of where it can be pretty bad. If I'm trying to get script in to your system and I shove a bomb, a byte order mark, in the middle of the word script, and you just delete it. So it becomes what I want. I'll show an example of this in a minute. Um, so the, the, the solutions for handling unexpected Unicode is to fail or error and also to use the safe replacement character, which Unicode defines as FFFD. A lot of software does actually use that under the hood. Um, some of it has to be configured and told to do that, though. A common alternative to the FFFD is a question mark, too, which can, can be safe, depending on the situation, provided it's not a syntax character. <coughs> so attack vectors for doing this sort of stuff is to bypass filters, WAFs, NIDs, validation. I mean, this has been going on for years, right? There's still a lot of different ways to do it, though, that we haven't really seen people do that much. Um, so you're delivering exploits. So here's an example of an exploit in Safari where they consume the byte order mark. So if I pass Safari a string like JavaScript and I shove a bomb in the middle of it, it's actually going to ignore that bomb and treat it as the protocol handler JavaScript. So it can get even pretty nastier with, with Safari. You can pretty much shove that bomb anywhere inside of a HTML document and get your script to execute. Oh, okay, I think I actually have a demo of this. Let's see. Okay, here's a test case page I have. Okay, here's my link. Click it executes. Now, let's go take a closer look at that. What's going on there? <coughs> okay, here's the HTML that pulled that off. It looks pretty harmless, right? I mean, it's just JavaScript colon alert. Now, let's just look at the hex, right? It's not just JavaScript colon alert. It's Java blah, 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 all right? I mean, <laughs> there's the byte sequence, EFBBBF. See that sequence right there? That's the byte order mark in UTF-8. Pretty nasty. OK. Let's see what else we got here. Take a closer look at the bomb. Um, this is a very special character in Unicode. It has meaning. It's supposed to be used at the beginning of any file to tell the text parser how to handle the file. It basically is supposed to tell the text parser the encoding and the endianness of the file. And what do you do when you run into the bomb in the middle of a file? It's supposed to be used at the beginning. Well, that's, the, that's where we start asking questions, right? And that's where you, you can see I can pull off an attack in some cases. Um, this character also has a, a, a actually a two-faced life because it's also known as the zero-width no-breaking space, which is why I was able to use it as an 
in the invisible attack earlier. All right, now talk about casing real quick. Um, attackers can manipulate casing operations, upper, lower, and this can actually multiply, multiply buffers and cause buffer overflows. Let's take a closer look at that. All right, here's that same old character, Latin capital letter I with a dot above. When you call too lower on that character, the Unicode tables have a mapping for it. So you map it back down to a Latin small letter I, okay? So, okay, I want to pull off an attack, and I know that you're doing a too lower operation somewhere in your uh, web app, right? So I stick in a script with that special character as the I, and when you call too lower on it, I get the, I get the string that I want. And the other issue is that, well, the length of the original string is not the length of the string when you call it to lower. And um, that's another, um, uh, I'll just jump ahead, because that just leads us into buffer overflows. So incorrect assumptions about the string size, counting cars versus counting bytes. I mean, this has all been beaten into our heads, right? We know the secure coding practices around this, around uh, Im improper widths and calculizing. Uh, calculations, but in Unicode, I mean, uh, if you're trying to do this yourself, you might run into trouble because look at the maximum and expansion factors for casing, okay? This is from the Unicode technical report. When I call two upper or two lower, I can have a maximum expansion of three times the size of that string, and that's using this special character right here. These characters are the represent the maximum expansion. So, okay, let's take another look at something. Normalization. I think you asked about this earlier. What happens when you normalize and the bytes change? Look at the expansion factors for normalization. You can have expansion up to 18 times. An 18 time multiplier on a string, on a, on a single character, that's pretty good. So if you're trying to overflow buffers, um, let's try some of these characters. How do you handle that? I mean, yeah, sure, know the difference between bytes and characters and do secure coding. I mean, the frameworks are designed to handle this, so leverage them when you can. ICU is the International Components for Unicode, pretty much developed by IBM, Google, um, and the Unicode Consortium. <coughs> and .NET and some of the other frameworks handle this situation is fine. Talk about controlling syntax this is another root cause. A pretty interesting attack, okay, when a character like 18OE, which is the Mongolian vowel separator, acts like a space, okay? What about quotation marks? So what can you do with these things? You can manipulate HTML parsers and JavaScript interpreters. You can control syntax, fun stuff. So I'm going to show you a quick attack in Opera. I sent them this bug last year. Um, it's been since fixed. But you can basically use the Unicode formatter characters to act like a white space. Um, here's what it looks like in HTML. So um, I can, I'm an attacker. I control a string and some HTML attributes. And hey, they're not, they're not putting that string in quotes. But hey, they're not letting me put in a space either. So what do I do? Well, you can use uh, the Mongolian vowel separator there, which actually um, represents a space. Let's take a look at that. So here's another test case page. I actually have a few characters that do this. Um, here's the separator. I'll just click it. You'll see that it'll execute. And I'll go back over here and show you what that looks like in the uh, hex editor. So here's the string. You can see there's no space here visually, right? You got uh, href, pound, or hash, on click equals alert. And then you just flip over to the hex, and you can see that that character there in between the hash and the on click is my special Mongolian vowel separator. Okay. Love that character. It's come in handy for a couple things. So that's it. That's the attack. Opera used to um, interpret that as a white space character, that and a few others. Okay. Um, they said they were compliant with HTML4 specification because that specification says, leaves it open to the user agents to interpret white space how they want. HTML5 does not. 
It actually specifies like four characters and no more. Okay, closer look at the Mongolian vo vowel separator. Um, if you look at the top left, it, it's, a, it's assigned a category, the ZS, the separator space, and it also has the binary property, white space, assigned to it. This is a very special character. Um, okay. And that leads us sort of to, yeah, you got to be careful in these cases, to, uh, you know, question the specifications like HTML4 before you implement them. So uh, speaking of specifications, these can become a root cause issue. Character stability is a big issue in Unicode because every time a new version comes out, new characters are introduced to the repertoire. Those don't make it to the specs like IDNA and name prep for some time, years maybe. And they're certainly not going to make it to the, um, they probably won't make it to the software that implements them as well. <coughs> so design spec, I've, you know, I've questioned handling and Unicode's uh, verbature around how to handle bombs in the middle of a file. This has since actually been changed and they actually have a much more secure way of defining that. Um, I'm gonna just, how are we doing on time? Anyone? We're running out of time. Five minutes? Okay, I'm gonna have to fly through the rest of this stuff, I think. So, character set transformations. I've kind of beat on this. Just avoid them if possible. Don't try to transform between different character sets. Use Unicode end-to-end -end if you can. Use Unicode as the broker, which is a common, sy common setup. You see people in take a, you know, you have a web app that takes in shift JIS, and then it hands it off to uh, the operating system, converts it to Unicode, and then it has to hand it to some maybe Oracle database or some other system on a Sun server somewhere, but that system wants it in an ISO format, so then we got to convert it back to an ISO format. What happens along the way? Usually a lot of bad stuff. Um, the PUA mappings or the private use area mappings in Unicode, some, you know, this is where stuff starts to get really weird because every implementation system differs. You know, Windows might use PUAs for brokering Unicode. Um, uh, Linux and Unix systems might do it differently. So, to be safe, transform, case, and normalize all prior to validations. Character set mismatches. What happens if I tell you it's uh, um, shift JIS, but really it's some other encoding? How do you handle it? So, and you know, a, a web browser, they've got ways of dealing with this called sniffing. Usually, they'll try to figure it out. So maybe what happens if the HTTP content type is one ISO 88591, but the meta character set or the meta tag says it's a curse set of shift gis. How does the browser handle it? Safest bet is to force UTF-8 across your entire web application. If you can, use UTF-8 everywhere in your web app and use UTF-8 um, to display all the pages and also for all the inputs and error if you're uncertain. So we've been working on some tools to help identify some of these issues, identify the hot spots so you can take a closer look because um, it's not always necessarily an issue. But I'm going to talk more about this in the next hour. I don't think I have time right now, but over in the product room, I think um, this is a web application security testing tool. And it helps identify Unicode hot spots uh, as well as a bunch of other issues in web apps. Also have a, we've been working on a visual spoofing protection API. So this, this is a way to provide users a consistent uh, visual indicator that an IDN spoofing attack or other visual spoofing attack might be going on. Um, and with that, I think I'm going to go ahead and close it and say thank you for having me and open it up to any questions. Or did I fry everybody's brains? <laughs> How is IE handling this with UTF-8? Uh, IE, um, I mean, all the browsers are different, but UTF-8 in general is pretty safe in, in all the browsers. Is that what you're referring to, like character sets? Yeah, I mean, all the tags you talked about, Apple, Safari. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, IE is pretty good. Um, they they take a kind of a default safe view for IDNs, and they just punicode everything. Um, 
which you know kind of ruins the idea and experience but they actually have some exceptions to that rule um, but in general most of the browsers seem to handle UTF-8 pretty good too all right thanks guys <laughs>